Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's time that we talked about something that up until this point has been conspicuously absent from our calculations. Um, but before we do that, let me remind you of something. Okay. Uh, remember when we were looking at the modified Atwood machine for the first time, and we had the air track, and we had a very, very small mass hanging off the end. It was 20 grams, 0 0.02 kilograms. And it was pulling something that was about 300 kilograms, right? Um, several, several times the mass of what we've got here. And we saw that just a very little force will accelerate an object. In fact, um, all we have to do in order to accelerate the object is make sure that the net force is just greater than zero. In fact, it hardly has to be greater than zero. It could be almost zero, and the object will start to accelerate. Now, take that idea to this right here. I've got a crate here filled with different masses. Most of them are one kilogram masses. Now, obviously, we could talk about the weight of this whole object, this system of objects. Uh, we could talk about the normal force that the table is exerting on the objects. But what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put an applied force on it in the horizontal direction. And you'll notice that nothing really happens, nothing really happens, and then something happens. It starts to accelerate. Okay. Well, you'll notice that I've got a force in this direction on the crate. There's definitely a force there, okay? But the object is not accelerating. Now, the gravitational force is perpendicular to my push. The normal force from the table also perpendicular to my push. So what is causing the force that balances the force of my push? If my push is in that direction, there must be a force that is back in the opposite direction that is of an equal magnitude to the force of my push right now. Okay. Now, that obviously is going to be the force of friction. The crate is in contact with the table, so there's friction between the crate and the table. So when I push in this direction, the force of friction pushes back. Now, there are two kinds of friction. The first is static friction. Static is a word we use that means not moving. So, as I push right now, the object is not moving, but there is obviously a force of friction because it's not accelerating. Now, if I push hard enough, then the object moves, and then we're dealing with something called kinetic friction. Okay? So, these are the two kinds of friction we're going to talk about. We've got static friction and kinetic friction. Where static friction the object is not moving and kinetic friction in which the object moves. Some books will talk about something called rolling friction, which um, our textbook doesn't really discuss this, and to be honest, I haven't seen it in many textbooks um, at all. Uh, so that, we'll kind of maybe briefly um, see about that. Now, one thing that we'll see if we look back at our crate demonstration here, is that one thing it depends on is the two types of materials that are in contact, right? Here I've got wood on stone because the tabletop is made of stone. But we're going to get a very different result if we had steel on stone, okay? Now, we have to be careful too because it doesn't just depend on the different types of uh, materials involved. Though we'll see, that is one of the more major factors. So on the screen right now, if I can figure out how to edit this in, 
right, is a table that you will find in your textbook. I don't know what page it's on, but just go to chapter 4 and find the second table in the um, chapter there, and it's table 4 two coefficients of friction. And we'll see that it depends on surfaces, right? The first is wood on wood, ice on ice, metal on metal. Uh, if it's lubricated, like with some kind of oil, steel on steel, unlubricated, so just, you know, steel on steel, right? It's going to be very different than something else. Rubber on dry concrete, rubber on wet concrete, etc. So we've got a lot of uh, different things things here, all right? And we'll, we'll go back to this and we'll talk a little bit more about what those are and the significance of each one of them. But we'll notice something too, that here I've got wood on stone and I've got a very, very strong force of friction that I've got to overcome. But here I've also got some wood and if I put that onto the stone and push it, well, it really doesn't take much of any effort to accelerate that object. So you could say, oh, well, they're different kinds of woods, but we'll notice, too, that if I start to load this one up with some more mass, well, it does get to be a little bit more difficult to push against. Again. Now, remember, it's only just a very little force that is required to accelerate an object, okay? So we're seeing that the material matters, and there's one other thing that really matters in this case. Now, it would be tempting to say the weight of the object, but if I were to take these and put them on the very side of the table here, say like so, then I could get somewhat of the same effect. Okay, so it's not necessarily the weight, because remember the weight of this object, when it is right here, is pointed straight downward. Okay. It's not the weight. You'll notice that when I put it here, I pushed on it. So if it's not the weight, there's only one other option, and that is the normal force. So we'll see that the force of friction depends on not only the types of uh, materials in contact with one another, but also it depends on the normal force, all right? So materials in contact and the normal force. Wow. These are the things that the force of friction will depend on. Now we've already seen how the materials in contact kind of work. Let's talk about the normal force. There is a direct proportion relationship between the force of friction and the normal force, okay? Uh, there's no real concept behind it. Uh, we can't derive this relationship or anything. This really had to be done by experiment, okay? Um, so generally, when we're setting up an equation, if we know it's a direct proportion, then we know that this is equal to this multiplied by some other value. In this case, it's a constant value. So we can say the force of friction is equal to mu times the normal force. So this is a Greek letter. It is called mu. It looks a little bit like a u with a tail on the end of it. It is not an m. It's more of a U with a tail on the end of it, okay? Now, one thing we can see is that in order to find out what this is, well, we've just got to do a little bit of algebra here. Divide both sides by the normal force. 
And here you have it. Mu is the ratio of the force of friction divided by the normal force. So this value here, it's this ratio, and we have a special name for that. It's called the coefficient of friction. So mu is the coefficient of friction. Now, just like we said, there are two types of friction. There is static friction and there is kinetic friction. There are also two kinds of coefficients of friction. So we'll have one that we'll call mu s, which is the coefficient of static friction. And then there also is mu k, is the coefficient of kinetic friction. And these are different from one another. Uh, we can see if we look at this table again that we're given not only the surfaces but we're given the coefficient of static friction and we're given the coefficient of kinetic friction as well. Um, <clears throat> So we'll see, too, that the coefficient of static friction is always greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. So when we're looking at our equation once more, we'll see the force of friction is mu s times the normal force for the situation where we're dealing with static friction. And the force of friction is mu k times the normal force when we're dealing with kinetic friction. And we'll see that if you take the same object that will end up having the same normal force and you multiply them by a number that is higher all the time on this side, then we can see that the force of static friction is always going to be greater than the force.